I want you to turn with that thought in mind to John chapter 15, because I want us to think from this passage what our purpose is as Christians. What's the purpose of the Christian life? If, if someone would ask you that question, don't answer out loud, but in your heart, how would you answer that? If someone would say to you, hey, you're a Christian? Well, what's the purpose of the Christian life anyway? I think John 15 will answer that question for us. It will tell us what God wants from us. You know, John 14, 15, and 16 are rightly called the upper room discourse because it took place in that upper room where Jesus celebrated the last Passover meal. He had a Seder with his disciples just before the crucifixion. That's the place, that upper room, where you have these truths that are included in John 14, 15, 16. Last message, you might say, that Jesus shared with his disciples prior to his crucifixion. And of course, he was preparing them in this last message to them for his departure. In fact, in chapter 14, just drop back a moment to verse 2, he said, I'm going to go. I'm going to go, and I'm going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to go. He says again in the 14th chapter, in the 12th verse, he says, I go to my father. He says again in verse 28 of chapter 14, I go away. So he's preparing them for his departure, which is going to happen because he's going to be crucified. Three days later, he's going to rise from the dead, and he's going to hang around with his disciples for 40 days. And at the end of that 40 days, he's going to ascend to heaven, and he's going to go away. And uh, he won't come back until it's time. <laughs> and we don't know when that time is, but we know that he's coming back for his people. That's what John 14 tells us. He said, I'm going to go away, but I'm going to prepare a place for you. And I'm going to come again, and I'm going to receive you unto myself, that where I am, you may be also. So, but chapter 15, where I've had you turn tonight, this chapter reveals what Jesus really wants from every single believer. And really, it answers the question, if you've ever been asked or you thought about this, why, when we get saved, why doesn't God immediately rapture us? Why doesn't he immediately take us to heaven? It saves us a lot of grief, right? Uh, why does he immediately take us to heaven when we're saved? Well, we're left on earth for a purpose. And the purpose that John 15 tells us is that we are left on earth so that we can become spiritually productive. And the Lord shares this truth with us by bringing up a very familiar illustration to the Jewish people. And that is the illustration of a vineyard. In chapter 15, verse 1, he begins, I am the true vine, Jesus speaking, of course. I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman or the vine keeper. And so he brings up the, the metaphor of the vineyard. A very old metaphor. You'll find it in several places in the Old Testament. You'll find it, for instance, in Isaiah chapter 5, where, Jesus, uh, where, where the prophet uh, it says, now will I sing to my well-beloved the song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved, that's God, hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill. And then in the seventh verse, he says, for the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. It's again repeated in Psalm 80, uh, Israel as a, as a vineyard that has been that, that the wall surrounding it to protect it has been broken down and it's been plundered. And it's a picture of how God has judged Israel by allowing her enemies to destroy her. It's pictured again in Jeremiah. 
So there's several times. This is an old metaphor that Jesus is using that is so familiar to the Jewish mind when he says, I am the vine, the true vine, and my father is the vine dresser or the vine keeper, the husbandman, the King James Version says. Do you have that picture? Can you put that up for us, please? I want to I, I just uh, uh, have a picture here of a vineyard. And I just, just keep that up for a while because I, I want to make reference to it a couple of times here. Jesus says in that first verse, I am the true vine. Okay. What he means by that is that he is the trunk. Okay. The vine is the trunk. That's this part here. So Jesus says, I am the true vine. He's the trunk of the plant. The, the part that grows out of the ground, if you will. And um, the vines that you see here are typical. And they're usually kept by the vine keeper to about anywhere from 32 inches to 46 inches high. Basically waist high. And uh, the vine ends... In a large knot, see it. You can the grapes are hanging down so low you can't see it clearly, but it's a large knot. You can see it maybe there on that one. The vine, the trunk, a large knot up there, and from that knot, uh, there are branches that branch out in either direction. Okay, so get the picture in mind here. The vine is Jesus. The trunk of, uh, of that plant is Jesus. And uh, from that uh, trunk, there protrudes that large knot and then the branches in either direction. Look at verse one again. I am the true vine. My father is the husbandman or the vine dresser or the vine keeper. Jesus says, I'm the trunk of the the uh, of the vine my father is the keeper of the vine now the vine dresser or the husbandman as it's called here is either the owner of the vineyard or at very least he is the keeper of the vineyard it is the vine dresser or the husbandman's job to tend the vineyard and to coax from that vine as many pounds of grapes as possible. That's the vine dresser's job. And when a vineyard is properly tended, then it produces a very high yield of grapes, as you see in this one pictured here. Drop down to verse 5. Jesus says, okay, I am the vine. He means he's the trunk, okay? But he says, you are the branches, okay? Jesus is the vine. Believers are the branches. You or believers are the branches. And the focus of the vine dresser or the vine keeper, his efforts are the branches because it's the branches that produce the fruit, and normally, these branches that spread out from the top of the trunk, these branches that go in either direction, normally they are either tied to a trellis. Here, in this case, it's a wire. Uh, or to a, wood, a wooden stake, or could be, I guess it could be metal, that they use to, uh, to prop it up. And the reason they do that is so that uh, the air can circulate around the the vine, uh, where or the branches rather, where the fruit will be produced, as well as the sun, that the sun can can hit the the branches, and uh, as a result, they can uh, get the sunshine that they need for the production of the fruit. And also, I would imagine that. Uh, they're put on a trellis or they're staked up so that the vine keeper himself 
can with uh, uh, have easier access to tending uh, the vine. These vines, in a vine dresser's mind, are like animals to him. I mean, he treats them tenderly, like uh, like an animal. They're they're living plants, obviously, but uh, he lovingly cultures them so that they bear as much fruit as possible. And for the vine to really be productive, the branches have to respond to the vine keeper's attention. Now, all of this is very instructive for the 12 that he's teaching this lesson to in that upper room because they're super familiar with uh, a vineyard. In fact, it says at the end of verse uh, 31 of chapter 14, Jesus says, arise, let us go hence. Now, I don't know if they immediately left the upper room, but uh, when they left the upper room, I'll guarantee you on the way to the Mount of Olives, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane on the Mount of Olives, they, they passed a lot of vineyards. I guarantee that. And so they're very familiar with this. And what Jesus is sharing with them in John 15 just the simple stuff that we just uh, uh, looked at and thought about is not just interesting facts about agriculture. But what he's trying to do is in light of the fallout that will take place when he is crucified, he wants them to realize what their purpose is as disciples, even when he's gone. And so what we see in John 15, and especially in the first half, the first 16 verses, we see what God wants from every Christian life. We see the purpose of the Christian life. And it all comes down to one thing. And that is because we are not the vine, we're not the vine keeper, but we are the branches. The one purpose for the branch is it's the branches that produces the fruit. The fruit comes from the branches. It pops out of the branches. Now, it's, it, it's the, the, the sap that flows out of the trunk, out of the vine, into the branches that produces the fruit. But the only job of the branch is to brood to produce the fruit. Now, when Jesus says what he does in that fifth verse, you're the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him the same bringeth forth much fruit. When he says that, these men know what he means by fruit. We get debated sometimes about oh, what is the fruit in John 15. Some people think it's the souls that we win to Christ. And I wouldn't say it isn't, but the fruit is very clearly, and these men knew it, the fruit is good works. The fruit is your thoughts, your actions, your attitudes that glorify God, that God values because your thoughts, your actions, your attitudes glorify him. That's the fruit. That's the good works that the fruit represents. It is, the fruit is how God gets glory to himself. Look at verse 8, for example. Herein is my Father glorified that you bear much fruit. The way that God gets glory through our earthly lives as believers is that we bear fruit, that we have good works that glorify God, good works in thought, in attitude, and in action. You bear fruit when you let God nurture the Christ life in you. Now, remember what I said? I said that the branches, their only purpose is to bear the fruit. But the power that they get to bear that fruit comes through this vine. This represents Jesus, right? It's his life 
flowing from the vine into the branch that produces the fruit. And so our fruitfulness as believers, we bear fruit when we let God nurture the Christ life in us. When we let God nurture his life, Jesus is in us. When we let him nurture that life in us, you bear fruit outward to others that's visible to others when you let God work through you. Now let's think about some of the good works and uh, and some of the fruit, spiritual fruit that's mentioned. I'm just going to jump over for a moment to Galatians chapter 5. And here it says, but the fruit of the Spirit, and it names nine things. Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Fruit of the Spirit, it's called there. And I would say again, it would include spiritual fruit would include obviously these, but also it would include souls that are saved. And fruit is produced in every area of the believing life. For example, I think that you produce spiritual fruit by what we talked about on Sunday. We spent the whole day talking about grace giving. When, when you graciously give of yourself and your possessions to the Lord to bless others, that's fruit. When you put out the trash for your neighbor, that's spiritual fruit. When you take a meal to a, a, a sick brother or sister, that's fruit. When you uh, minister to others in order to glorify God, that's fruit. And you know, according to verse 16, the believer's fruit is the only thing that's eternal in our lives. It says in verse 16 that uh, he's ordained, God's ordained that you go and bring forth fruit and that your fruit should remain. That is, last forever. And so spiritual fruit is the only thing in our lives that's eternal. So that's what fruit is. I've defined it. But fruit doesn't just happen automatically. It has to be determined. Each believer, as I said, according to verse 5, is a branch. And the production of fruit in the believing life is clearly measured by God. There's a... a measured, a, a clearly measured level of fruitfulness in this 15th chapter. In fact, you might call it four baskets. You know, when they gathered grapes from a vineyard in ancient times, they, they had special baskets that they would uh, put it in. Often those baskets would be on their, they, they would have them on their back. But anyway, the, uh, there are four baskets that are actually in this 15th chapter, if I could call them that. God accurately measures every believer's spiritual productivity level. He accurately measures how fruitful you are as a believer. Fruit basket number one is in verse two. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit, he taketh away. Fruit basket number one. There's no fruit in it. It's a believer that has no visible fruit in their life. Fruit basket number two is also in verse two. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth or pruneth it. Fruit basket number two has fruit in it. There's a few healthy looking clusters of grapes in fruit basket number two. Fruit basket number three is also in verse two. He purges it that it may bring forth more fruit. Fruit basket number three is more fruit. You look in that basket and you'll see that it's maybe more than halfway full of plump, juicy, lush looking grapes. 
fruit basket number four is in verse five, where Jesus says, you're the branches. He that abideth in me, I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. So fruit basket number four is much fruit. It's a Christian life that is overflowing with spiritually big, luscious, extraordinary fruitfulness. And that, again, may I say, whether it is, is fruit or more fruit or much fruit, it's because of the life of the trunk of the vine that is flowing into the branches and that the branches are depending upon. You see, fruit doesn't happen naturally in the Christian life. It happens when you determined, when you make a choice to depend upon God to enable you to bear fruit, to enable you to love the unlovely and the unloving, to enable you to have joy when you're facing sorrow and tragedy, to enable you to have peace when everything's topsy-turvy and uh, they're, they're, you're facing turmoil. This is God dependence where that Christ life in you is the sap that flows from the trunk into the branch, you, that enables you to bear supernatural fruit because you're depending upon God for it. So this is what God wants from your life. God actively is tending your life so that you become fruitful. God is active in your life. He's tending your life as a vine keeper tends the branches of a vine, of a vineyard. He's tending your life so that you keep moving up spiritually, so that you don't stay on a plateau, so that you don't stay on a lower level. He's tending your life so that you move up spiritually. You become more fruitful so that you go from a barren branch to a fruit producing branch, from being empty to overflowing. You know, there's more always possible because God created you for that very purpose that you would bear that you would bear abundant fruit for him. We perhaps our dreams are too small. It's not about our dreams. You're here to fulfill God's dreams. And his dreams is that you become very fruitful, that you bear much fruit, that you bring him glory through an abundantly fruitful life. So let me ask you this. How would you describe the level of fruit bearing among believers currently? Not you, but all believers put together. Well, let me say this. Statistically, 50% of believers produce little or no fruit. 50% produce little or no fruit. 33% of believers produce some, some fruit. And only 5%, only 5% of believers bear a lot of fruit spiritually. So, I mean, that shouldn't be surprising to us. I mean, look at us. Just look at us, right? That shouldn't surprise us, those kind of things. But here's the question now that I want to personalize. Where do you fit in? Where do you fit in to spiritual fruitfulness? How much fruit do you see in your life today? Spiritual fruit bearing it's not some unique phenomena that is only for super Christians. This is, again, what God created you for. This is what God created you to be. This is what God expects from you as a believer, to be fruitful for him. And that's God. 
And you'll never find fulfillment in your Christian life. If you look in your fruit basket and you see it's half empty. He wants much fruit. He wants abundant fruit. I am the vine. Ye are the branches. He that abideth in me and I in him. The same bringeth forth abundant fruit, much fruit. Without me, ye can do nothing. These grapes didn't happen because they, they made it happen. That's what made it happen. 